Better yet, what if you die in the state of sujood? You were in wudu and you were making sujood and it was your time to go. Subhanallah. Now that is called a successful way to pass away in the great state. Your last deed being salah. Think about it, my sisters and brothers. We don't think about this often, but this could be us. I would like to share with all of you a story that brought tears to my eyes the first time I read it. And it is a story again to reflect upon, inshallah. He remembered his grandmother's warning about praying Salah on time. My son, you shouldn't leave Salah to this late time. His grandmother's age was 70. But whenever she heard the Adhan, grandmother got up like an arrow and performed Salah. He, however, could never win over his ego to get up and pray Salah. Whatever he did, his Salah was always the last to be offered and he prayed it quickly to get it in on time. Thinking of this, he got up and realized that there was only 15 minutes before Salat al-Isha. He quickly made wudu and performed Salat al-Maghrib. While making dhikr, he again remembered his grandmother and was embarrassed by how he had prayed Salat. His grandmother prayed with such tranquility and peace. He began making dua and went down to make sajda and stayed like that for a while. He had been at school all day and was tired, so tired. He woke abruptly to the sound of noises and shouting. He was sweating profusely. He looked around. It was very crowded. Every direction he looked in was filled with people. Some stood frozen looking around. Others were running left or right, and some were on their knees with their heads in their hands just waiting. Pure fear and apprehension filled him as he realized where he was. His heart was about to burst. It was the Day of Judgment. When he was alive, he had heard so many things about questioning on the Day of Judgment, but that seemed so long ago. Could this be something his mind made up? No. The weight and the fear were so great that he could not have imagined this. The interrogation was still going on. He began moving frantically from people to people to ask if his name had been called. No one could answer him. All of a sudden his name was called and the crowd split into two and made a passageway for him. Two people grabbed his arms and led him forward. He walked with unknowing eyes through the crowd. The angels brought him to the center and left him there. His head was bent down and his whole life was passing in front of his eyes like a movie. He opened his eyes but saw only another world. The people were all helping others. He saw his father running from one lecture to the other, spending his wealth in the way of Islam. His mother invited guests to their house and one table was being set while another was being cleared. He pleaded his case. I too was always on this path. I helped others. I spread the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I performed my salah. I fast in the month of Ramadan. Whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered us to do, I did. Whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered us to not do, I did not. He began to cry and think about how much he loved Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He knew that whatever he had done in this life would be less than what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala deserved. And his only protector was Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He was sweating like he had never done before and he was shaking all over. His eyes were fixed on the scale, waiting for the final decision. At last the decision was made. The two angels with a sheet of paper in their hands turned to the crowd. His legs felt like they were going to collapse. He closed his eyes as they began to read the names of those people who were to enter Jahannam, hell. His name was read first. He fell on his knees and yelled that this couldn't be. How could I go to Jahannam? How could I go to Jahannam? I served others in my life. I spread the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to others. His eyes had become blurry and he was shaking with sweat. The two angels took him by the arms. As his feet dragged, they went through the crowd and advanced toward blazing flames of Jahannam. He was yelling and wondered if there was any person who was going to help him. He was yelling all the good deeds that he had done. How he had helped his father, his fast, his prayer, the Quran that he read. He was asking if none of them could help him. The Jahannam angels continued to drag him. They had gotten closer to the hellfire. He looked back and there were his last pleas. Had not the Prophet Muhammad said, how clean would a person be who bathes in a river five times a day? So too does the Salah perform five times a day cleanse a person from their sins. He began yelling, My prayers, my prayers, my prayers. The two angels did not stop. They came to the edge of the abyss of the Jahannam. The flames of the fire were burning, his face. He looked back one last time, but his eyes were dry of hope and he had nothing left in him. One of the angels pushed him in. He found himself in the air falling towards the flame. He had just fallen five or six feet when a hand grabbed him by the arm and pulled him back. He lifted his head and saw an old man with a white beard. 
He wiped some of the dust off himself and asked him, Who are you? The old man replied, I'm your salah, your prayers, your namaz. Well, why are you so late? I was almost in the fire. You rescued me in the last minute before I fell in. The old man smiled and he shook his head. He said, You always performed me in the last minute. Did you forget? And at that instant, he blinked and he left his head from sajda. He was in a sweat. He listened to the voices coming from the outside. He heard the adhan for Salat al Isha. He got up quickly to perform wudu and make prayer. This was just a story, my dear sisters and brothers, but I want you to think about it. What if that is us? And what if we're not saved? As this man was in the story. Will you be sad on that day? Will you wish you had done just more? What if we don't have that second chance, my sisters and brothers? What if we don't have that second chance as he had? Make this intention to pray, my dear sisters and brothers, and then take the action and begin, and inshallah you'll find your way to success. You see, success starts with doing the things that are the most important in order to get the things done that we think are success. You see, success is not measured by the things that we own or the status that we have. It is measured by which hand we'll get our book in on the Day of Judgment. Now you guys might be thinking, well Zora, I know many people who don't pray and they're successful. And I know many people who do pray and they aren't successful. We have to remember that the reward is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and is not in this world. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives each person success in different ways. And never imagine someone who's worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not successful, even if he doesn't look it in this world. For true success is obtaining Jannah in the hereafter, inshallah. Now I'm going to go to point number three, inshallah. How do you inspire yourself to jump out of bed every time you hear the adhan? Well, this seems to be the hardest for many Muslims. MashaAllah, many Muslims pray, but they pray what they want to, and sometimes it is right before the next adhan about to be pronounced. I have discovered a secret formula to help me jump out every time the adhan is out to pray. And inshallah, I want to share that formula with all of you today. I want you to take out a 3 by 5 card right now. Please take one out. And if you don't have one right now, please do it as soon as you have some time. And I want you to write on it. Number one. If today was my last day, would I pray right now? Number two, what can I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for right now? What is my wish list? And number three, remember that Salah erases sins. Alhamdulillah, remember that Salah erases sins. You need to post at least ten of these three by five cards all over your house, inshallah. I have them posted everywhere, on my walls, in my bedroom, in the kitchen, in the living room, by my computer, anywhere where my eyes will hit. I have these little 3 by 5 cards posted. And what it does, it's a reminder. As soon as our eyes hit it, and it says, if today was my last day, would I pray right now? So when that adhan goes off, imagine your eyes hitting this 3 by 5 card. So if you have these 3 by 5 cards posted everywhere, inshallah, it'll just be a reminder. Post them in your car. Post them in, put them inside your purse. Put them by your phones. Anywhere you're at, put them there so it's a reminder for you, inshallah. You know, one excuse that I often get is a lot of people tell me, Well, Zora, I don't want to pray sitting down or laying down. And many people think that one of the conditions of Salah is to stand up and pray. Well, my, the next hadith I'm about to read will clarify that, inshallah, for you. Narrated by Imran ibn Hussein. May Allah be pleased with him. I had piles, so I asked the Prophet wasallam about the prayer. He said, Pray while standing, and if you can't, pray while sitting. And if you cannot do that, then pray while lying down on your side. When we hear this hadith, many of us say, Alhamdulillah, because we have our health and we can pray standing up. But for those people who do not have their health and they're sick, SubhanAllah, they can still pray, either lying down or sitting down. They can still pray. There's no excuse why we can't pray. And now, how about the people who are born without arms or legs or who are born with some deficiency? That's something that many of us don't even imagine because, mashallah, that's something we don't have a problem with. But there's a Muslim brother, mashallah, who had that deficiency when he was born. And subhanAllah, he is praying, he is doing his salah. And he is someone who I admire so much, for truly he's successful, not only in his worshipping of Allah subhanAllah, but also in his...